wear the same clothes you, you wear, wear your own clothes and walk in from the street <laughs> I long for that part yeah it's good on. but it's it's very funny I've been in uh, three period things in which I've worn the same blouse <laughs> So that, I drew the line at one point and said, I can't keep wearing this. But it's true. I wore, wore it in uh, Tea with Mussolini, Gosford Park, and something else I can't remember. Maybe, they just went to the same Lavender. costumer? Maybe it's Lavender, yes. <laughs> they went it's, to the same costumers, you think? Yes. yes, yes, we do, because we go to this wonderful place in London called Cosbrops where they have the original. We don't have... And that's terrific to wear things that were actually around at that time. And all those clothes were original, 30s all clothes. All of them. They were pretty fragile, but they were mm. original. I was mm. held together with two pay table lots. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, your character has reached her 60s or early 70s, it's never made completely clear, without ever having, should we say, fallen in love? Or uh, had any yes. great emotional experience. Mm. Isn't that tricky emotional territory? Uh, because you have to convey a, a girlish longing uh, in someone who is as elderly. Well, what you have to do, I think, is that you have to, you have to remember all those experiences in your life of, of being in love, of falling in love, of, of perhaps being rejected, of whatever, and remember that this woman has never had any of those things because very much of the circumstance, because of the 30s, the young men had gone to the First World War, there was very many young men killed at that time and women and children on their own. And this woman, isolated, you know, with with her sister, who she totally relied on. Um, so you have to feed all that, so that becomes a... that becomes the... That becomes what the character is. That what the character is missing isn't you know. Although to some degree that's the Maggie Smith role, isn't it? You already did that in Lonely <laughs> Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn, oh, yes. Charlotte Bartlett in A Room with a View. Yeah. You once famously summed up your entire career in one sentence. You said one went to school, one wanted to act, one started to act, and one still <laughs> acting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm guessing. To, I'm guessing there's a lot more to it than it's that. Sort of, it's that. That's it. <laughs> well, we'll take. <laughs> you leave me speechless. We'll take a little break, and we'll come back with more with Dame Maggie Smith and Dame Judy Dentis. It seems strange to hear yourself called Dame all the time. Yes, it always sounds odd. I've not got used to it. Stay but with here us for it's more. better, you know, it's a better conversation the word dame. Dame is Yeah, well, there's nothing the like air, a dame yeah. in America anyway. <laughs> We're back with Maggie Smith and Judy Dench. I'm not going to say Dame anymore. Is that okay? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> they're, uh, they're, the film, which they appear together, is called Ladies in Lavender, and it's opening next Friday at the Paris Theater here in New York. Judy, I understand that the first role you ever played was as a snail when That's you were it. four? Snail. Is, is that true? Five, at age five, a snail. But I, it, didn't, it didn't catch the imagination much, <laughs> nor the audience, nor that of the audience, and I gave up on that. I thought I'll be a theatre designer instead. <laughs> but your father had been a, a, a physician to a theatre company, hadn't Oh, he? yes, yes. He, he was doctor to the Theatre Royal in York and famously appeared there once when he went to see, had to go and see somebody, walked just too far. <laughs> and appeared with a black bag on the stage. <laughs> and a tweed coat, yes. Well, of course, there's that old, is there a doctor in the house thing? Yes, but he, he was taking it literally. <laughs> uh, was theatre something that was in your blood as a result of well, that? Well, we were all taken, the boys and I were all taken to theatres uh, as young people. In fact, I remember going to see Cuckoo in the Nest, which is a Ben Travers farce, and laughing so much. My mother had to take me out and take me back the next night to hear the second part of it. I just thought I was going to be ill. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maggie, I, I know I, I quoted you saying one yeah. went to school, but there had to have been something before. Was there a reason that you went into acting? You didn't play a snail, did you? No, I didn't. I, I, mean, I was saying this. Uh, I, I remember very clearly doing... Um, the Pied Piper of Hamelin at a school that I went to and although I didn't do anything in it very much but I, re I remember that very clearly I got my start in that as well I, you I, didn't I, yes I, I played the uh, the the crippled boy oh, oh how extraordinary my my job 
in it was to help the little cripple boy at the end. I, it would have been so much better if you'd been helping me oh. at PS 16. <laughs> Isn't that an odd coincidence? Yeah, so, so that's what I that's that's where I started. But then I I didn't go to the theatre much. I remember seeing about the first thing I saw was the shop at Sly Corner, which frightened me so much. Was Moffaty Woffaty was <laughs> this is an actor that we know in London called John Moffat, a wonderful actor, and Moffaty Woffaty was in it. But it was very scary, so I didn't really have much uh, experience of the theatre at all. But then I I did have a kind of a wonderful teacher at the school I went to, and and she encouraged me really to do it. Is there a moment where you realise that you can really make a living from this? It never crossed my mind that that it wouldn't that I wouldn't. I didn't know about making a living. I hadn't thought of that. I just so much wanted to do it. I I know people listening right now. Uh, don't even need to have you identified, either of you, because your voices are so distinctive. Um, and and a lot has been written about your voices. Maggie, uh, uh, Carol Brahms, the, the, the writer in Britain, said that you have a voice like a strangulated dove. And I think he meant it as, as a great compliment. I hope so. <laughs> But Carol, Carol Brahms was, was a lady. She, she was a lady. Oh, she. Oh, yeah, she, she was, was one of I never know with she Carol. She was a very waspish lady, yes, was. I indeed. never know whether the Carols in Britain, because it's spelled C-A-R-Y-L, <laughs> she, are men or she women. She collaborated with the man whose name has completely escaped me, who wrote No Bed for Bacon. Mm-hmm. And what was Ned he Sherin, called? No. no, it wasn't Ned Sherin. Isn't that awful? I can't remember. And then, Judy, uh, I understand that an actor friend of your father's once said that you had no hope of a future on the stage because you sounded like you had laryngitis. Yes, yes, I've said it myself. <laughs> I, when I did cabaret, uh-huh. I had to um, put a note in the program. <laughs> but that's <laughs> what you normally saying, sound? This is not, this is not um, <laughs> a cold. Uh, this, is, uh, this is with me. But yet, you <clears throat> the reason I bring up voices is because... Um, it seems to me you'd be both great in radio drama as well, that you you express an awful lot with your voice. Well, you, you've done a lot of it, haven't you? I have done a lot of radio drama, yes. And my, my husband was simply wonderful at it. Oh, he was wonderful, terrific. Michael. Kind of really, totally at home with it. But I did, the very first radio drama I did was with Donald Wolfett. Uh, and uh, so that was a bit... Um, nevertheless. Frightening. <laughs> nevertheless, yes. <laughs> well, he wasn't chasing you around the oh, no, table. Certainly so. not, no, <laughs> certainly not. No, certainly not. But there, there's a, there are all sorts of constraints when you're doing that because you can't raise an eyebrow, you can't uh, communicate anything with body language, all wonderful things that actors can do, often without having to speak, but in, in radio, you just simply have to tell us all through uh, the tone of your voice. And uh, is is that something you think about, or is this just something that comes automatically? I, I've not done it. I no, do, but you, I but you, I've but you do. I've done one play. But I, you just, you just, it's like the camera will pick up thoughts if you if you th- if you think yeah. them they will pick up it up without you doing anything and sometimes i think the radio can do the same thing really skilled people on the radio but you know michael Jude, jude's husband was was terrific because you never thought that it was for a moment that it was on a printed page i think that's the downfall of a lot of it you know when it does sound as if it is very staid that's a big problem for people like me. Um, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm reading something. Well, you don't and sound the, to say you're reading. But the great thing about actors is they uh, they always sound like they've just thought of what they're about to say at that moment, even though they have said those lines again and again and again. Yes, don't you long, though, sometimes to put on the radio and to hear something that you think is a documentary yes. and it's an actual fact to play? I long for that. It's a kind of test. Well, Orson Welles pulled that off very well yes. with War of the Worlds and had yes. sent half of America People into a panic. Only, yes. So if it's done well, yeah. I guess... Yes, it, it it can sound natural, but often it just sounds like people. But are that reading. was that was like an announcement, wasn't it? That really scared them. Yeah, it was the news broadcast. Yes, it was the news, which is sort of different to, to kind of animated dialogue. There, there was a salon article that talked. 